Um, so I know it's like just before tea. I'm holding you to the break. Um, having said that, let's uh, let's start with what we wanted to share with you. Uh, so before I begin, I thought we'll do a quick quiz. How many of you all know Nielsen? Yep, yep. Just just share. What do you know about Nielsen? Let me let me free, rephrase it. Retail. Yep. Okay. 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 So I think all right, and um, there's. Um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what is it that we do before we get into what is it that we are doing on the machine learning front. Okay, just to give you a heads up on the same, and I hope it works. So I'll have to. Does the video work? So basically, we measure. Okay, we measure what consumers watch and buy. So there's data is what we deal in and millions and trillions of records is what we deal in uh, can we play the we yep. uh. change never looks the same it can be small creating a connection finding a new fan shifting your point of view or it can be big connecting all the dots Reinventing the way you work. Transforming how you see the world. But the one thing about change that always stays the same is that it never stops. And we never stop moving. So you know what's next for your business. No matter what change looks like, know your next move. Whether it makes things simpler or more complex, Know your next opportunity, because connecting you to what's next is what drives us forward. Know what's next, and you'll get there first. So for us, every data is a big data day, right? Be it media, be it retail, literally 100,000 consumers, you know, what are they measuring? You know, what ads have they watched? What have they seen? Everything's get, everything gets measured. Even in India, we have about, uh, you know, 700,000 SKUs that are tracked just in India. So you can imagine what is the scale in 100 countries that we're there over the world. What is the kind of data we are dealing with? We literally go to 55,000 stores every day and we measure what is being sold there in terms of which item, which product, uh, you know, is being sold is what we measure. So the amount of data that we track in terms of stores, consumers, um, you know, um, imagery is massive. So that's the, you know, kind of context that I wanted to share with you, with you all. And uh, uh, we're, we're basically data and we do a lot of research on that data. Making sense of that data is what we do. Now, if we look at how, uh, you know, uh, if you look at two measures and you will see a blue uh, circle and you will see a green circle there, you'd see in the past, you know, data was always actively, you know, measured. If you wanted to know what's happening in the market, you'd have to do a survey, you'd have to go and ask somebody, what do you believe? You have to do a lot of that. Just imagine what have you been doing since morning and the amount of digital footprint you have left the data that we used to collect has only got compounded with the massive pieces of information or digital footprint that we are leaving. So that's what's happened in terms of, you know, uh, the percentage data generated has evolved from being actively generated, so the dark blue has kept coming down, to being more passively generated, which is a lot more digital footprint available for us to touch and capture. And if you look at the green circle, it kind of tells us how has research evolved. So research, analytics, data, you know, is still there's a lot which is happening from a measurement perspective, perspective, but it's now moving into the journey and future we expect it to be a lot passive. Nobody's wanting to say what we, you know, you all know how the say-do behavior works, right? What we say versus what we do is so different. 
So how much do you ask and how much do you get and how much truth do you see in it? So therefore, that's the journey that we are uh, on and we are taking to kind of integrate various sources of data, be it actively captured or be it passively measured and make sense of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this will just give you a sense of, you know, uh, the people who are making sense of this kind of volume of data. We are literally, uh, India is one of the biggest centers of excellence. Uh, we literally have about a thousand plus data scientists in India uh, and across the world, predominantly in India. We have a hub in Bangalore and Chennai and in Baroda, predominantly revolving around the space, who are making sense of this data. Yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, what I wanted to share with you is what has been our machine learning journey? What are the various touch points at which uh, we are using machine learning, uh, you know, in the entire production process and getting, you know, numbers out to our clients because we measure what's happening in the market. So what is that process or that journey that we have taken, uh, sharing some use cases and also our learnings and our thoughts on the same. Um, so uh, these are just, you know, the kind of tools and how we have moved. Just imagine we are a data company. So going open source itself was a, was a big piece of us, right? We sell data. And now we have to be open about it. And if you have to be open about it, you need to share as well. So that itself has been a journey. Um, so it's another quick video to talk about uh, you know, what we're doing. Look at it. Uh, we are in the space of research, right? So research will require us to design sample, then to collect data. We have field offices which go and collect the data. We get also data from a lot of uh, retailers. So all the modern guys gives us their data. E-commerce players give their data. So there's a lot of data that we get, and there's a lot of data that we collect as well. Now to collect, just imagine India as a country. You know, we're talking about a billion plus population. We're saying FMCG is sold in about, you know, 10 million outlets in India. How do we say that 10 million number? It's an estimate. How do we estimate for it? We design for it. And that's where the entire, you know, leveraging geospatial imagery to understand how the landscape is evolved. You know, you saw the zero blocks, right? These are the areas where shops will not be there. These are the areas where shops will be there. The entire estimation algorithm, again, uses a lot of science. And then we get on to data collection and there will be a couple of case studies we'll show around data collection and data coding and where we have kind of moved from a journey of earlier everything would come back to our head office and we would find, oh, there's a problem in the data that we've collected. And then it would go all the way to the field office and we'll ask what happened there and say, oh, the store closed because there was a metro opening. Yeah. Now it's all got front end. If the guy is not inside the store, you know, you will see when my colleague Sri Raman talks about some of the things that we've instituted, how the entire dynamics change uh, in terms of how we are doing what we are doing. So the entire transformation journey started about a couple of years back. 
and it has taken a couple of years to reach here and it's a journey so you know because technology is going to kind of forever make us the student that we need to be so um, so um, so we start with a sample design we collect data we code data just imagine items uh, you will have one retailer having an item master you will have another retailer having a different item master the same product you know the same product will be coded or recognized differently so unless you know okay this stands for a particular brand sku grammage price and this also stands for the same product you will not estimate right so that is the level of accuracy when we need as far as coding is concerned so there's a history because of our history there's a lot of database available but each year 100000 sku's are you know just imagine the number of launches that take place in the market across the world it's like 100000 sku's at 50000 items per day that's the count that are getting generated and barcode compliance in india i'm sure you all know where we are right it's nowhere close so nobody has you know you'll have the same barcode but multiple items so which is where how do we use machine learning and uh, you know nlp deep learning basically to kind of come up with okay this stands for this and this is the level of accuracy those are some of the you know case studies we thought we'll share with you and also uh, we have something called as consumer panel so we go to respondents house and uh, basically capture receipts what you have purchased because we measure what they buy right so we, there's one way is you go to the store and you measure get a point of sale point of sale has its own challenges but you, that's one way or you actually audit so that there are like two different kinds of streams of data that you will uh, kind of work with and how you integrate all the same and fuse all the same is what uh, we'll kind of show you through yeah um okay sorry i'm clicking the wrong button so i'll hand over uh, one of the tools that we have deployed uh, which is called the it's a route optimization it's not 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 very new right and uber will deploy it and everybody would have deployed it what's so unique about what we have deployed and uh, what are the constraints or uh, you know that we faced and the challenges we faced i will let uh, shri talk about it so over to you shri raman am i audible okay so um as she mentioned uh, maybe let me take india as an example right um 1.4 billion population with uh, 10 million uh, retail stores so the complexity which we have as uh, in india you have kirana shops mom and pop stores supermarket hypermarkets you have the store size differs the locality differs you have a lot of constraints which is coming in um so and that's one and when we are talking about uh, 14 million or 10 million Uh, populations of stores and if you are doing a sample of 1 million the complexity is if there are four stores you do four factorial ways of going to the store and uh, reaching the store information and doing a data collection so if there are 1 million you have 1 million factorial ways of doing it which is a very complex thing and uh, manually planning it in an efficient way is is a cumbersome task to deal with so what is our objective the objective when we started this program is we had a lot of business constraints as i said starting from a kirana shop to a mom and pop store to all supermarket type of markets we have a variety of stores <coughs> and the data collection differs the locality differs so there is one complexity so our main objective was to increase um, the resource utilization and to optimize and bring up an uh, efficient way to do the planning so that our data quality improves so that's one of the key objective when we started this solution called planning scheduling and route optimization so what we do is we try to get various informations of the um, uh, stores uh, along with their geo coordinates and from the resource uh, this is the data collectors we try to get their geo coordinates we try to do a, a actual route distance by doing a geo coding process we try to it various third party systems to get our geo codings and we form an n by n matrix when we form an n by n matrix we will get to know uh, store 1 to store 2 store 1 to store 3 various combinations we will get to know what is the actual route distance and time taking to reach that store for a data collector with that we now form a clustering uh, techniques so the clustering techniques it can start from a simple k mean algorithm to a fuzzy algorithm to um, the um, uh, db scan algorithm as well density based um, uh, algorithm uh, clustering algorithm because everything is not um, um in a proper circular shape or in a triangular shape 
Your, it's not polynomial. Certain things can have irregular shapes of doing the clustering. We are talking about, again, 49 out of 255 countries which we are dealing with this. So our algorithms are clustering based or different means of algorithms which we have used based on the dependencies. We try to group it. The reason why do we do a clustering is our search space will be reduced. And when our search space is reduced, our algorithm can run parallelly and it can optimize the efficiency. So with that and with the various workout and business rules. Business rules is, let me take a simple example of India. A person who speaks Hindi can go to an Hindi store. A Marathi language person cannot go to an Hindi store. A male cannot go to a beautician shop. Female cannot go to a liquor shop. Because we do data collection across all stores. These are all hard core constraints which is coming in. Our algorithm has to ensure that it tries to learn and optimize in an effective way. So with all these inputs, we try to in turn feed it to the algorithm. The algorithm is um, uh, nothing but uh, we build a meta heuristic um, uh, algorithm. There are a lot of algorithms which is there in the uh, market, starting from the genetic algorithm to um, ant based colonization, so and uh, B B based or B colony optimizations. There are various algorithms, but this hybrid approach of greedy and simulated annealing, greedy, that's an effective way of trying to combine based on the local, based on the uh, distance, the metrics which I was saying. It at a point of time, it tries to plan it. We try to build 16 to 32 different combinations of plants and we try to build it out. And after that, we build a simulated annealing. We build a simulated annealing, which in turn tries to move from the local minima to the maximum global minima in turn, where it tries to give you the optimal uh, distance. So this is something which is running in, uh, in a parallel way, so that uh, uh, the reason for clustering is all these clusters which runs in based on it, it runs all in parallel way, and it tries to give you a real-time planning in a faster and effective way. So all this put together helps us in a better optimized plan uh, in an effective and controlled manner. Uh, compared to the other genetic algorithms which we had, we compared it, we observed this combination gives us a better uh, way so that's how this was finalized. We are trying to improvise on top of it by doing a reinforcement learning. All that uh, is in turn trying to is underway, but this is the current way of uh, doing it. So, uh, so what was observed on a manual planning versus what was done uh, on an automated planning? We are able to clearly distinguish that the root optimization, the crisscrossing between a person manually planning versus what the system automatically plans was completely different. So this was the result which we are, um, achieved across countries. So now talking about our uh, planning solutions, right? So next is uh, planning is done. So the data collectors are doing a planning. Now we need to do, do what uh, Nitya was talking about monitoring them and whether they are doing the right data collections and whether they are taking more time to do a data collection. We need to monitor something. So we have to have a person uh, logically looking at these data collection process. If they are doing mistakes, um, the old way they will have to intimate, the next day they will go and correct the data collections because data is very important. From a sample to population, we extrapolate it. That's where this all this automation helps us in bringing in. We have built a chatbot, uh, an AI-based uh, chatbot, which is uh, homegrown solutions which have built, which in turn helps us trying to converse through the um, uh, quality control information, tries to validate, tries to be constantly in touch with the data collector on the field and try to understand whether he is doing the right data collection and tries to get information. Maybe I can give you a few examples. During Diwali event, the store will be hugely crowded. So the data collection process will take time. Weather events, um, people reaching to the store will take a lot of, uh, reaching to the store will take because of the various road conditions. All this has to go into the algorithm and tries to identify. The planning is done, whereas during the execution time, are they following the planning? Various in turn, these uh, set of uh, pre, post, and the um, chatbot combinations put together helps us try to monitor the uh, data collector in an effective way, which in turn helps for a better efficiency of data um, quality of auditors. And uh, their utilization is also greatly improved. And we see a better span of control of details of what they are doing and what we are observing so that they don't have to repeat to the same set of stores multiple times. So this is something which this data collection as a platform starting from planning to monitoring as put together and leveraged us in this. So this is one of the use case. Um, Nitya, you want to take it? And you know, uh, for us, just imagine this is the basis for millions and billions of dollars that companies invest in. They look at what the market share is. We can't afford to go wrong here, you know. So, you know, bonuses are dependent. Uh, you would have heard so many companies doing market mix models. 
Nielsen retail audit is a key component of that because you're measuring what consumers are buying in the market. Every company will have their own sales, but they will not have what other companies sell within that category. What this gives them is an unbiased picture. So how true this is, is so, so important that it's, uh, you know, this is hardcore, this is like critical, this is like the single source of truth, uh, which is unbiased, right? And therefore, the, there are alerts like if the person is not within, you know, it'll, it'll kind of, if it's not within the geo location, in the 50 meter range, there'll be a triggered race. And that person will have to click a picture and chat and send it. Otherwise, the executive will call. So that is the kind of rigor that is deployed in the data collected itself. Um, the second big, uh, you know, um, if I were to say use case is, uh, you know, the coding place. You know, coding is an area where a lot of, I mean, all of you guys would have seen a lot of uh, machine learning getting deployed. So uh, here is another place where right from OCR to deploying deep learning. And one advantage we have is because we've been measuring for 97 odd years, there is a wealth of data in terms of SQs already available. So there's a very good training data set that we have, uh, which helps us you know, optimize that bit to a great extent. So completely, uh, we're using, you know, uh, CNN uh, kind of models to kind of go through the route of, uh, you know, store, so right from store collection, automatically it will recognize uh, use, using OCR technology and then the coding becomes much more faster. We are still at about 87, 90% accuracy range. So there is a level of manual that we still need to do, but we are at a very healthy rate um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the models that are there. Uh, this is a case. So, for example, we launched e-commerce in India. Uh, we get data from quite a few players, quite a few e-commerce companies, and we estimate for the rest of the market. Now, for estimating rest of the market, just imagine you will have so many e-commerce companies selling so many things. We measure especially this, we're talking about FMCG e-commerce. So when I say FMCG, it'll be your shampoo, creams, you know, skin cream. Those are the kind of products I'm talking about when I say FMCG. You know, your toilet soap, your uh, atta, your rice, oil, all these are your fast-moving consumer goods. And uh, you, what we get is just imagine, we have a panel of 100,000 uh, we have a tie-up with a company, roughly a panel of 100,000 odd, uh, uh, you know, users. And they share, it's, it's an opt-in panel. For us, uh, asking a consumer is imperative. We, we, we are highly GDPR compliant. Privacy, privacy is core to us. So this panel, the person, like normally we tend to accept everything. If we install an app, this will, you know, send three reminders, have you read this? Have you read it? Then it's an opt-in panel. So that's the kind of protocol we follow so that, you know, any GDPR issue later, we're not in that, um, um, uh, you know, challenge per se. And then obviously the items are coded by ALML techniques and then it's projected for the rest of the market. So this is one of the used cases, basis which, you know, machine learning was deployed for the entire item coding, especially e-commerce. E-commerce, just imagine the number of players coming in, the number of, you know, categories that are, kind of growing e-commerce is growing at a, you know, massive rate in India. Yeah, uh, this was the other uh, case study. Uh, this is, uh, you know, where, how do we ensure that this again, uh, uh, you know, it's again in the coding space, but especially uh, because our field guys not only go to stores, but they also go to consumer homes to collect bills. That's called as consumer panel. So that's, that's something that we go and measure. What are they buying every, every day? So then they give their bills. You know, you may not get the internet, you know, Wi-Fi kind of connection there. So how do we counter for those kind of how, uh, algorithms won't run unless and until you have those algorithms in your mobile. And therefore, the kind of technology deployed to collect receipt and coders has been kind of developed. Um, you know, for this is a Germany example where you know, right from, you know, 370 receipts across 10 retailers, we were able to kind of code it really well in terms of uh, both the precision and recall. So it's like that's the kind of modeling work that's happening because each retailer will have a different way of coding an item. And therefore, region into item into price. And retailer, uh, other markets, unlike India, which is an MRP re regime, 
every day low prices, each retailer will have their own prices. So price cannot be used as a metric of commonality. So just imagine the amount of combination it has to be assessed before you know, okay, this is the right item for which we are talking about this product. So that's the kind of quantum that has been, uh, you know, developed uh, per se. Uh, with that, I'll share one more case study, which is in the output format. So we have seen a lot in terms of data collection, how we've gone about it, data coding, how, how we've gone about it, data delivery. So one of our solutions is in the space of uh, what we call as store observation. So basically, just imagine you go to a store, there's so many planograms you'll see, visibility. You know, each company will have their own, you know, ads running in the store. And um, especially in traditional trade markets, India is like 30% uh, of the world's traditional trade stores are in India. So India, the retailer at the store influences massively because you still have that relation taking place. Your modern trade and your e-commerce have come, but there's still like 10, 15 per 12 percent, you know, in metros, they're higher, 20, 20 plus is where they've reached. But at an all India, India level, still it's a traditional Kirana store where you go and say, okay, they do. Why? Because you have that credit facility, you have that anytime you'll go, you know, pause device, the device is there. That guy has calculated even before the pause you have scanned. Because he's so good at calculations. He's not going to wait for you to scan every, he's not going to scan things for you in, at uh, evening 5 or 6, or 6 p.m. when the footfall is higher. So how technology can be practical is something that always we as, you know, people need to kind of think about. Is it practical? What is the lighting arrangement? Will we be able to use an OCR? We have an OCR. Will that lighting work? Unless and until you have a six dimensional, you know, with all those lighting, just imagine our retail outlets, uh, you know, the lighting, the size, where the products will be, he won't even allow you to enter. So how will you do image scan? So some of these technologies, how relevant or how evolved they need to be for India. And therefore the challenges for India are far more higher in terms of um, complexity. So this is one solution where we have built, which is a store observation. So just imagine you have a cooler present, is it as per what the company had planned it to be? Half the time the cooler will have eggs also will have everything else other than what it was supposed. <laughs> you know, the man manufacturer kept, placed money and put that uh, cooler there. I don't want to take client names, both are, all are my clients. So, but you'll have everything other than the products that the manufacturer. So store observation is a big, big field. Now when you do store observation, you know, it's so much easier if you're able to kind of use these kind of uh, techniques. Yeah, another video. <coughs> Nielsen Image Recognition, where we transform in-store data collection using computer vision and deep learning. Using product localization and classification, images are processed by the system, automatically identifying products, promotions, and price. By using automation based on computer vision and deep learning, we're able to process large amounts of data and thousands of products without the need for additional collection efforts. This allows higher accuracy while recognizing specific features on different products, even when those products have similar visual characteristics. To improve recognition accuracy, convolutional neural network architectures are used instead of traditional computer vision. Once the visualization and recognition results have been submitted, they are then sent through an image recognition platform to validate for accuracy. At Nielsen, we pride ourselves in having the most comprehensive and detailed product reference data. This combined with the largest high-skilled retail field force in the world. The Nielsen reference data, in conjunction with state-of-the-art image recognition, scan, and survey features, gives us a global advantage in data collection and retail measurement. Or this is a use case that we thought was, uh, you know, particularly relevant. This has been done in India. So all these cases I'm talking to you about are things that have been done and deployed and tested in a market like India, which is one of the most complex and challenging. More because it's uh, very diverse and dynamic. You will have the super, super premium and you will have the extremely marginal. You're talking about uh, you know, 600,000 villages in India and 5,000 odd towns, 6,000 odd towns in India. So the 
the, the scale at which we're talking about is far more complex, uh, which is where, you know, we thought showcasing these studies, which are largely tested out in India, except for the, I think the receipt one is uh, a non-India example. Most of the examples are an India case study. So this is all done in India, made in India, and for India as <laughs> well. Yeah. Uh, coming to the second, and this is something that we've started since the uh, last couple of years, which is like uh, into the area of forecasting. There's a lot that we are doing uh, because there's so much of data collected and there's so much of data available. Obviously, forecasting is an area where we are definitely using, uh, you know, higher order advanced regression models to kind of predict how the outcomes are going to be. And these are also tailored by looking at relationships with various macro indicators as well as how uh, you know, um, companies are, you know, going to take decisions uh, per se. So um, just to kind of sum up, if I were to talk about our journey, yeah, um, I think uh, it's been a three, four years of transformation because we've moved from uh, literally not having anything on a, so we used to have our own platforms. They were all on individual servers. They used to run on individual countries. We started deploying about uh, handhelds about seven, eight years back. But in terms of how each of those have advanced, like even now in the handle itself, now there's machine NLP being deployed. So, you know, your time taken by the field auditor, et cetera, has reduced drastically. So, so uh, I think the technology has got deployed over a couple of years. It's not been like, because you had to keep the ball rolling as you're changing the engine. So how to keep continuous, you know, um, how to keep that business continuity in mind while changing, uh, you know, um, uh, or wh while transforming your business. I think this is, uh, this has been our learning, which we thought we would share with you all and uh, hope you all can make uh, take away from it. So I think the first, if I were to kind of call out, we've put in three big, um, you know, takeaways, no surprises, talent, uh, obviously the tools, technology and techniques. And, but the most important, if I were to call it, is the mindset. Because uh, uh, I think uh, uh, being open, uh, you know, uh, being uh, collaborative, thinking agile, uh, thinking that it's not that we are going to be able to do everything. Some places we'll have to collaborate, some places we'll have to learn, some places we'll have to probably build. I think that mindset is very important. Uh, I think moving away from what if we fail to, we let's fail and let's fail fast. You know, uh, experimenting and doing proof of concepts. Um, I think now is the time that, you know, I think this is one place where we should definitely invest because that's where it will give you the returns. It may not give you the returns immediately, but definitely that's what has got us where we are. And, um, yeah, I guess it does need uh, investment of both time uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the cost aspect as well, but it's a long-term benefit. So that's been our uh, overall journey on, uh, you know, how we have uh, integrated and adopted machine learning, and we thought this will be useful to share. Open to questions. Um, Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. So, just imagine in India. I'll start. I'll give you an India India example. We started this. Uh, so we were not Nielsen when we started in India. We were called ORG Marg or Operations Research Group. It was started by Vikram Sarabhai in 1961. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was started to measure one of their brands called Swastik. It was a toilet soap. And they wanted to, you know, understand what is the market share, because they know their sales, they don't know competition share. They wanted to measure that. That's how it started. Now, how do we design our uh, service? Just imagine India is like, as I mentioned, 600,000 villages, 500,000 population, uh, 5,000, 6,000 towns, 100, 1 billion population, 70% is rural, 30% is urban. So we look at something, uh, you know, when we design, we look at population as a very good measure or auxiliary variable uh, to estimate for what the sales would be. So just imagine, I have a data, government will always release the census 
I will have the data at a state, at a town class level, what is at a district level, at a sub district granular, whatever level you want, I have what the population is. Right, so I know what is the population. What I've seen is there's a very high correlation between population and stores. Now what I do is I understand I need to cover 100% of metros because they're very diverse. And as I go to smaller towns, they become more homogeneous. So that's where the entire sample design happens. So we go to a panel of 40,000 stores where we collect data. And when we say collect data, it's actually our field auditor will say, Five unit of lux, ten unit of something, you know, for two units of, he actually manually counts that. There will be some which are POS, there will be some which are manual, there will be some modern trade data anyway shares with us and e-commerce anyway shares with us. So therefore we collect data and then we say, okay, in so many towns, in so many panels, this was the kind of sales, so therefore, at an all India level, how, how much would be the sales? So we are estimating our universe in Nielsen to be, like FMCG universe to be 10 million outlets. So we estimate so. 40,000, that's the extrapolation that we do. Does that answer your question? What, what is in for me? Oh, so as e-commerce, so as example, a store, both. Yeah. Why would e-commerce share with you the data? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so let me start with the traditional trade mom and pop stores. So I think two things work. So uh, we obviously do share cooperation fees. So there is a cooperation fees that we do give them. And uh, our field force, just imagine goes to, we have a 5,000 odd field force on field ground stuff, which is collecting data. So they know what's happening around the market. So what the retailer gets is, Achha, what is selling there? What is selling here? Aapke paas ye product nahi hai. So he gets that knowledge and over a period, a relationship as well. So there are like, you know, there's a softer and there's a harder aspect in terms of a traditional trade stores. Modern trade stores, it's a barter arrangement. We, we give our data. Similarly for e-commerce, we, we give a lot of data because we collect so much of data across uh, 100 plus categories. So we measure so many categories, so we give a lot of data. So it's about our arrangement. Yep. <laughs> so any more questions, happy to uh, connect. I'll be outside before I leave. Yeah. Thank you so much.